education platform. Um, I'm so, so, so excited about this uh, conversation that we are about to offer you. With me is Ryan Takata and Erica Chongshech. They are devised theater artists among like, I don't even know how to compliment y'all enough because you're so diverse in your talents and <laughs> dance and, and, and choreography and theater and performance of all, of all natures. Um, but a little bit about kind of where this conversation comes from, like a lot of the ones that we've been having lately, it came from viewers like you. Um, <laughs> because somebody asked, hey, let's talk about devised work. Um, and I know nothing about it. I adore it, but I have no idea how it works, how it is born, how it is sculpted, um, how it comes to be. So this is a real exciting chance to learn from the best as well as um, share that with y'all. So thanks for that question. I think there were a few people who would every now and then would chime up and be like, um, devised work, hello, devised work, hello. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so here we are. Um, Ryan, Erica, thank you very, very, very much for giving us your time and your wisdom for the hour. Um, would for having you us, Lauren, and thank oh. you. Hey, Lauren, Gunderson, thank you hey. for everything that you've been doing. Oh, you've, been, you've been just like putting so much beautiful, um, just beautiful stuff into the world. And I just, uh, really appreciate the way that you've been kind of like galvanizing and inspiring so many oh, man. folks. Right Thank you for all that Thanks. you can do. I don't know what else to do, but keep making things I know. and talking I know. about theater. Oh, I know. I felt like this, like in the first, sorry, now I'm just going to stop talking. No, great. Dude, Ryan, go. Ryan and I talked about this, that like the first week that this pandemic hit, I was losing my mind. I was like clean, deep cleaning. <laughs> and like, I was so into homeschooling that you know, oh yeah, me too. That first week. <laughs> oh my god, the first, and then I was like, "This is, this is, I'm not made, I'm not cut out for this." No. <laughs> and so, like having, you know, having the work and having people to work with is really, yeah, really great. So, yeah. Well, that that was my whole philosophy: is if we can't make theater, well, we sure as hell can talk about it endlessly. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we might as well use that as a way. And then I find the more you talk about theater, the more you end up making it. The more you end up making relationships that turn into things. So. Mm. You know, but thank you very much for that. Um, I've been encouraged by everybody who's asking questions and sharing it and reaching out. So I think we've certainly built some strong communities for when all of this is over. Do you over feel more like people are in a different, I mean, you know, you've been in conversation with folks in a different way that I have. Like, do you feel like folks are in a more reflective space because we've all had to pause for a minute? Like, I think as theater artists, we're just like always like, running and like go, go, you know, go. You know, filling up our time <laughs> in such an intense yeah. way. Like do, in your conversations, are you feeling that people are, are? Yeah, I think for the first weeks and months, it was a lot of like, uh, it was the, 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 the lashing back at the, well, Shakespeare wrote Lear in his plague time. And I was like, don't put that on me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right, totally. Come on. Yeah, Shakespeare was not homeschooling his children either. So you know what? You yeah. can just sit back down. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I then think we, we, I'm finding some folks were not ready to talk at all. The first time I was like, hey, you want to get on a Zoom call and project it to the world and talk about your feelings? Some people were like, no. Yeah. And some were like, sure. So I think we've all a little bit evened out in terms of ability to and the confidence to talk about where we are with some vulnerability. There's been some great artists that have said, I haven't written anything. So there you go, that's me. And, and that I think helped people go, okay, I don't need to prove how productive I am or how creative and I can just kind of sit back and, and witness, which is artists work as well. Yeah. Yeah. But now I'm finding people are a little bit more able and maybe just more used to it and feel the ground under their feet a little bit more, um, but I don't know. Um, all right, so I'm gonna turn it back to y'all for a second because I want people to know, the first question um, I ask basically everybody is like, how did you come to be you? How, are, how do we find you in this moment? Um, and that can be a list of all your wonderful degrees or cool relationships or your little dreams as little kids, whatever it was that kind of got you to know that you wanted to do this and how did you manage to create this? Ryan, would you, would you start? Oh gosh, sure, yeah. So, God, how did I become me? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of trial and error. <laughs> no, um, I, you know, I, I've had a really twisty, bizarre path into uh, this broad field of performance. Um, I, you know, did, I was a musical theater kid, kind of, 
in high school. I wasn't very good at singing. Like, I, I, I don't know why they kept putting me on stage just because I think I was <laughs> like cool constantly. Um, <laughs> I, you know, like I was just, I was just kind of loud and queer and kind of obnoxious, but I wasn't skilled by any means. And then I ended up kind of pursuing acting as a track uh, for like a year at a state school. And then I just decided I couldn't do that anymore. But then I went to art school and I transferred and what was really exciting, I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, which has um, one of the sort of few experimental performance programs um, in the nation. Um, one of the one of the only art schools that really has a strong performance program, and I was lucky enough to meet people like Lynn Hickson and Matthew Goulish and Mark Jeffrey and a bunch of really rad people who are working somewhere between theater and performance and this thing that we might call devise theater. And so that was that was really my beginnings around like learning some of the the skills and tools and conversations around devise theater. And then um, shortly after that, I went to grad school. And I uh, did a, a, a PhD in performance studies. And that's where I'm at now. And now I'm a lecturer at Stanford. I, I teach performance and experimental performance and avant-garde works, basically everything that's on the fringe that nobody really <laughs> knows how to talk about or <laughs> wants to like address or look at. And I'm just obsessed. Like anything that is really confusing or difficult or, you know, doesn't, doesn't even look like art or theater. I, I, I love spending time with that, that kind of work. That's what I keep busy with, I would say. And um, I've been working with Erica for the past few years on a project, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about more so, but called For You. Um, and that's been a, a big pleasure, collaborating with one of the most brilliant performance makers I could possibly know. So. True, true. <laughs> um, Erica, will you tell us your general story? And just for a second, if I look this way, I'm checking on people's comments and if they're posting any questions that I can throw your way. So okay. are they like, like, get them off? <laughs> That's why I'm looking at the get, ceiling. Because get I out of here. I know. <laughs> so Erica, how do you come to be you? And yes, how, yeah. However you'd I, like to answer I that. I that Ryan like took it back to high school, which I, I, I tend to not think very much about my high school years but it reminded me of something that I haven't talked about or I don't know it's hard for me to find things that Ryan doesn't know about me but I but I think that I've never told you this so I had this English teacher uh in high school and his name was Mr. Sinclair if he's out there in the world he was like a brilliant a brilliant person I don't I haven't talked to him since the last day of the last day that I attended my junior year of high school but um he a lot he so he we had to read we had to read Brave New World and then I, and then we had to like present a report on it. And he, he opened it up that we could like do a report. We could report back in any form. And I had, I was like in high school, just having an alternative experience in my brain. But I decided I wanted to do this like puppet show that would use these um, cows, uh, these plastic cows and Play-Doh. And there wasn't there, I can't, I mean, it's been a long time since I've read Brave New World, but there was like the drug, like Soma, and the Play-Doh represented the draw, the Soma. And like somehow I did a whole show and I stood on people's desks and I wore this like vintage outfit that was my Aunt Robin's. It was like a 1960s like flare mini shift dress thing. Yes. And it was like, I, it was, a, it was like an amazing moment. And then afterwards, somebody in my class said, Erica, do you know what, per, a per, do you know what performance art is? And I was like, no, what is it? <laughs> And they're like, you should be a performance artist. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and then Mr. Sinclair, like I wanted to make a skit for the, where I wrestled with him for the, for like a school tournament. And he agreed and we like choreographed a wrestling dance. And anyway, so that's what I'm I thinking love it. right now. Um, but at that time in my life, I wasn't doing like, I was, I would, didn't identify as like a performance maker and I wasn't, you know, I, tried like maybe audition for the school musical, but probably didn't have much success, but then ended up, um, uh, I ended up moving through many chapters and ended up at UC Santa Cruz um, and um, started kind of making my own work at UC Santa Cruz. And I, and I would just make work with whoever was kind of available to me. I had transferred into the school as a junior and I didn't live on campus and I uh, uh, ended up living in a, house where there were just a bunch of like non-students but like really creative folks and we had a garage that people could move in and out of and I would just like make work on whoever was kind of 
around and <laughs> using whatever was available. Um, so I've kind of been doing, I think, the same thing <laughs> since then. <laughs> I mean, we all started in some weird forum where instead of being like, stop doing that, somebody was like, that's cool. Yeah, we were like <laughs> stubborn. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna stop. Like I, it's just yeah. it's stubbornness at this point. Yeah, indeed. Um, we're already getting some questions, but maybe for a second you can talk about like your definition of what you do, what devised theater is, what it looks like, can look like, has looked like. Just when people ask like, what do you do? What is your, what, besides like laughing, and <laughs> what, what, what is your definition of it? You want to go, Ray? Yeah, I'm. You know, I think it's helpful to think of device theater less as, um, like, less of a genre, and more of a process. Not that cool. genres don't have process, but I, you know, I think that it, when when you were talking about it in a theater context, like a traditional theater context or a dramatic context, it's it's less of a of a genre. Um, and the other, there's, a, I mean, there's a number of key things to it. That's one. More of a process has a bunch of methods that uh, we develop and discover and appropriate and uh, steal from other people. Um, that I think that it's often collaborative and ensemble based. It's, you know, there's one thing to make something just for yourself, which I think would put you more in the world of like a solo performance artist or something to this effect. But there is, there seems to be something about the ensemble and working with other people in, in a really particular kind of way. And we could talk about that more. Um, I think, it, there's a lot about the decentering of the uh, the dramatic text. I think that you know, in 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 drama or theater, we would think of the text as really like the plan or the thing that we keep going back to to understand what our activity is around the stage and in rehearsal and so forth. And of course, people you know, as directors or actors, you interpret that text a little bit differently. But it always seems to be sort of at the center. And I think that uh, for the, the work that I like to do and the work that I, I like to watch and see and participate in, um, the text is just one of many uh, pieces of material that I think people are playing with in, in that context. So other things you know, that are key to performance, like, pro, uh, like time and space and the body and <laughs> um, objects, like these things are, are equally as important. Um, I think there's a, also an a emphasis on performance as something between, um, something between theater and drama. There's like a real emphasis on the, on the doing. Mm. Um, and I, what else would I add to that? There's, there's so many things, but the other thing would just be about this idea of discovery that I think that in the process and in the making of it, we discover, um, we discover what device theater is by doing it in a certain way, by like just playing and, 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 and getting on. So it's not as mysterious as I think some folk might think that device theater is. And I know a lot of my students are like, why, why? Like what, where does this come from and who likes this and who does it? But I think that uh, in doing it and in making it, you're like, oh, cool, this is really addictive and I love doing this. Even though it might not make tons of money or it might, it might make tons of money, but it's, it's a really fun, I think, process for uh, approaching performance. Awesome. Erica, how would you kind of introduce people to this world who don't know it or kind of, yeah, what language would you put to it, if you would put language to it? I would probably send them to Ryan. <laughs> that was really well put. That was really great, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I was kind of jumping off of this question that you asked, Lauren, when people ask us what we do, how do we answer that? And I think that I devise an answer depending on the audience. Hmm. And I think that there's a lot of like calibrating and the cool thing about the, what, what I love about this work is that, that, that it's constantly shifting, that every single process that we engage with is um, determined and shaped by the people that we're working with, right? Yeah. And so like the, the answer to that question is always changing depending on the specific, um, the specific curiosity, the specific community uh, and the, the kind of like open endedness of the, of the process is what, is what attracts me because I feel like huh. I can enter into a process of devising a new work and that could end up looking like a straight up living room drama and yet the process that we have all engaged in together has led us to that place. Or I could, you know, enter into a collaborative process and it could end up looking like a, like a I don't know, like a wrestling match or like a high school marching band, you know? And, 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 the, and as, you know, as Ryan was saying, it feels like it's less about where we end up and more about devising a process. And I think that in some ways it's 
easier to see traces of one's of one's you know ethics and cares and passions because those 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 become embedded into the daily practice of making in a way that they're not always embedded into the into the into the product yeah i mean i think we should talk a lot more about process because that um this whole you know <laughs> My friend called it the alt MFA that I am somehow running <laughs> is um, started because of trying to articulate practical ways of talking about storytelling for, for playwrights mainly, although we've expanded and talked to every person making theater. Um, but it started as a kind of practical playwriting process. And that, of course, is much more the traditional version than what you're talking about. And it's text based. But it was like beginning, middle, end, dramatic structure, catharsis, climax, all of that kind of Aristotelian plus modern plus my own little weird ways of talking about it. So I think spinning to kind of how you talk about that, how, what is your dramatic structure? How do you find it? Um, and I can just maybe ask some of these questions. Uh, Julia Christine asked, how do you delineate roles in your devising group? You, do you fight. Have <laughs> wrestling, you keep talking about wrestling. I, that's not <laughs> <You> wrestle it out. <laughs> Do you okay. have one or more designated playwrights, um, actor, who does it, who determines the overall structure of a piece? So I, I guess, the, and, and another question was about what devising methods have you used before? So maybe some way of talking about how you, is the process the same every time? I'm assuming not. Um, are the people, you have collaborators that you trust and use or it, anyway, how, how does it kind of expand and contract and per, per um, project? You want to take a hit, Ryan? I'm going to. Oh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, wow, OK, so I mean, let's talk about process first. Let's, start, let's actually start, let's talk about beginnings. I think Great. that's one of the, the most difficult things is when you walk into a studio and say you don't have like a play script with you, or you don't necessarily have a plan, but you need to sort of devise one. Okay. Um, I think that everything is an open beginning. Like, I think that we can begin anywhere. So if we begin with like a, a question, that's kind of interesting, like how, I remember one of the projects I worked on was how do you, how would you dance a, a, a home? Which is kind mm. of a bizarre abstract poetic question, but that's like the beginning. So having something that you can say like, this is, this, is, this is the start. Or maybe it's something like you're looking around and you know, you're staring at your mug for two weeks and you're like, what is a mug? <laughs> like, how did, how did mugs become a thing and why why this handle and like what is handiness and you maybe you start to like do some etymological research around mugs and hands or something and then you you start to see that you have these little bits of 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 material that you can become more curious about and more curious about and research in a certain way and i'm, I'm really research driven i mean i think in my scholarly work there's like an academic aspect of that but creative research is just so open it really can be sort of anything um and that's what I love about the devising process that it, from a dramaturgical standpoint, it's not necessarily going back into like digging through like the history of the genre of realism or knowing exactly like the production history of a particular thing that you might need to reference or respond to. It's much more open in a certain way of like where your curiosity takes you. And you never know, some of it might be like a total dead end. And all of a sudden you might be, you know, learning about 19th century spiritualism and not do anything with it, but now you just know a bunch about it. But it's just like something you just become really curious about, right? So I think that every um, every beginning is is uh, you can begin kind of anywhere, um, and I think it's good to mark your beginnings. I think mm. that being able to like look back and say like where did we start? And Eric and I, and we'll talk more about this. But one of the projects we worked on recently is this one um, called First Things First in Arkansas. And, one of the, those beginnings was really just about the occasion of opening this new museum called The Momentary. And some of the first hits that we had were around uh, ceremonies that mark the occasion of, of first times. Mm -hmm. So groundbreakings and ribbon cuttings and um, inaugurations and these sort of things, maiden voyages, these kinds of things, christenings. And I think it was helpful sometimes when we were in our process to just to stop and go back and say like, okay, how is this a kind of opening ceremony? You know, mm. and even if you completely change, you drop it or something, it's just being able to say like, oh, how did I go from A to B? I think can be super helpful in evaluating and reflecting on your, your process. Um, so I'll just say that around beginnings and I'll let Erica talk a little bit more, but then I just want to say something about people um, that one of my favorite things about collaborative 
I mean, about the Vise theater is that we get to devise our own our own roles. And mm. I think that's really determined by what the work needs sometimes. Like you might be a primary instigator, right? Like you might come into the room and say like, I really wanna work on marshmallows or God knows what, on softness. Like my thing is softness. I need to like un un understand softness more. I need to bring some people that might be interested in on softness. And then we can kind of determine like what people wanna do and bringing those people in based on maybe some of their skills or non-skills sometimes. Um, I you know, I love working with non-performers in this way. Like I worked with my dad on a project which is really beautiful um, and, and kind of challenging <laughs> to be honest. Um, and sometimes you end up working with like a, a whole marching band and like they're they're on this they're on the same sort of page as anyone else kind of in the room. I think there's just a different distribution of tasks. Um, sometimes you might need a really clear role, like you're the dramaturg in the situation. You're like, okay, cool. Or sometimes you're a assistant director, dramaturg, choreographer, shaman, and like cleanup crew all at the same time, and like set designer and like admin. Like you just become you wear all the different hats and you learn in that and. That's also just as brilliant. I think, um, yeah, it's it's uh, really trying your hand at, at different things, but really, again, all about what the work needs, right? How do you push the work forward by putting on different hats really quickly or learning new things or jumping in or stepping back, you know? So Erica, how, does, how would you talk about process, how it comes to be, how you find it or yeah, what's the seedling of it and how do you know when you found, I mean, what, what, what does that look like? The seedling of process. Um, gosh, okay, so I'm trying to understand common core math right now, because uh, I'm trying to homeschool. And like the, I, I, as I've been engaging with this new way of learning math, I've realized that I am someone who like needs to, uh, I need to learn with objects. <laughs> And I need to I need to be able to articulate what it is that I'm seeing and I'm feeling mm -hmm. right and the way that I learned math was kind of this like rote memorization this kind of like stacking of numbers. And the way that my son is learning math as you just you saw you guys saw you got to see my baby mm -hmm. um, is all around like building visual uh, structures so that you can engage with these kind of building blocks and understand like from from the roots up what it is that you're building and I think a lot about that with the device you know, the, with a devised work, I feel like I, I'm, I, I am a person who learns best when I'm, when I'm, when I'm with other people who ask, um, like better questions than I do. Right. And like, I, I think that there are, uh, there are, there are a lot of things that keep me up at night. You know, there are a lot of things that keep all, uh, keep all of us up at night. And I feel like my way of like sorting through the things that keep me up are, at night are to, um, like build a community to research with. And so um, uh, I, I'm a little bit forgetting where, what, the, what Julia's original question was, but she was asking around Genesis. Yeah, well, it's kind of, it was a question about process, how roles are defined. I think it's a kind of practical, if there is anything practical. Yeah, <laughs> is yeah. it just follow your nose, you follow your instincts? Yeah, I mean, or you how do you what you need. Yeah. You you follow your needs, right? Mm -hmm. If you have an impulse to create something, like what are what 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 is it that you feel hungry for that can help advance that that can help advance that need, right? And I feel like I'm constantly, especially nowadays, like I'm I I thrive on being in community, and I thrive on like my, like creativity comes for me when my own when my own assumptions are challenged. Like that's mm -hmm. when I feel like I'm able to make. Um, like bold strides in terms of like generating creative ideas when 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 I think that I understand something but somebody like puts a wrench into the way that I the, you know the way that I the way that I understand something to be mm -hmm. and so I I yeah for me I think so much of the work is just about about like finding the people and starting simply with that like starting with the people and starting with a very very simple prompt like what is the thing prompt. that's keeping you up at night what is the thing that you're wanting to like dig into mm -hmm. or it could be pizza you know it could be like there there's there there like but but articulating as ryan said like articulating that 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 seed with a group of people 
and then just like holding it in our hands and holding it in our imagination and holding it in our dreams and kind of seeing what generates. This thing about roles, I, I, I learned this from Ryan a lot. And our third collaborator, her name is Rowena Ritchie. She's not, she's, she's not here, but for, I learned it from working with both of them that like, you know, we come to the process with a particular history. I come to the, to the, I come, I come into the room with all, with, with, with my own experiences as like, I, I studied dance and I come, I kind of came in through like the dance, through the dance door, but we all come in with a certain like identity that is tied to like the ways that we've studied or the ways that we've spent our time. And one thing that's been so satisfying in this collaboration with Rain and Rowena is that, is that I'm asked to like, let go of who I think I am as mm. a creator, right? That the that the thing that we are creating might not need me to be a choreographer. It might need me to be a sculptor. And I learned this from Ryan all of the time. Ryan talks about like a pathetic attempt and that sometimes our pathetic attempt at making something like I'm not a sonographer. Let's say that I needed to let that, let the, the, the piece that I, um, was wanting to create re required me to build a building like my attempt to build a building with like cardboard and like these post-its and like these chapstick like my attempt to build something with these bits is is like that the effort it, 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 the effort in that the effort in that attempt is like poetic unto itself right mm -hmm. and so to not feel beholden by like oh I don't have the skills to write a play I don't have the skills to like become a composer well what like what happens if you try? And sometimes that attempt, sometimes the 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 work that comes out of that attempt is like pretty damn profound. Like Lauren, you're a playwright. So wasn't wasn't it Godot? Didn't he like write in his non-native language? Yeah. yeah. I mean, like this this way of like intentionally engaging with materials or with ideas that are just like out of grasp. Yeah. yeah. Do you think of it as building a thing, or is there other? Does the metaphor shift depending on the project? You, you, you know what I mean? Because I think so much of certainly the way I think about playwriting is architectural and engineering and kind of finding the scaffolding that holds the story. And then within those constraints, you expose your voice and surprise yourself and do all these great things. But it kind of it has some structural things. Do you yeah. when you're and also kind of how, how do you know when you're done <laughs> or is it you're ever done? done. <laughs> <laughs> when the money the runs out. Says it's <laughs> when the money runs out. When the and money we're done. <laughs> yeah. No, I think the I think the building metaphor is excellent. You know, I, I really do. I by like like anything, you can build something super complicated, mm -hmm. you know, or you could build a lean to. And I think that you have to decide what materials are available to you at the time, what time you have, like mm -hmm. if you only have time to make a one day performance, then you're gonna make a one day performance and it will be understood as a one day performance and that'll be mm -hmm. perfectly fine. If it's a five year endeavor, then that's a five year endeavored performance. You know, and I think that um, that building and how you build like the tool, I mean, I think we're, what the question is really after or like, what are some tools maybe that we can- yeah. I think so the sort of people of, watching, I think are practical theater makers and are like, okay, well, give me some exercises, give yeah, me some so, something. <laughs> so following what Erica was on, you know, I think in, 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 you know, around how we might build performances, this idea of the creative constraint. I think that, you know, when you're in school, sometimes you have like the schoolmaster that's like, you gotta do your work or something's making a kind of demand. But when you're, when you're making performance from scratch, there's no one hounding you necessarily, unless you've got like a commission or something, but you have to give yourself a kind of, uh, some kind of constraint, right? You have to make the, mm. the, there's a big empty room. You feel like you're in a giant empty theater, like make that theater smaller so that you can do something manageable. Mm -hmm. So a creative constraint could be something, you know, like only, um, only make a one gesture that is repeated 1000 times over the course of, of one minute, which is like, of course you can't do that. So it becomes kind of impossible or something. And this is something lifted from, from my favorite people of, of Goat Island, who I think are, are such a brilliant, I encourage everyone to like look at Goat Island's work and you can, you, there's a number of texts and go to their, their old website, They're, they've disbanded since, but this idea of cre giving us a, a creative constraint, which is lifted as a, as a method from Olipo and from other, you know, uh, moments of the avant-garde of having to build with and create within a certain kind of boundary. Um, I like to go for like really bizarre creative constraints, you know, like things that will necessarily lead to failure or lead to something where I have to be, um, I, I, I have to make the wrong choice to do something that's really scary, you know, like 
I hate stand-up comedy, so like maybe that's where I begin is like make a joke. And I have some really bad jokes that I've forced into projects. And I, I will maybe if we have time later, show. But you know, you, you're starting with something like that where you give yourself a kind of constraint. Also, like um, I love I do this with students, but giving a prompt, um, which is a kind of beginning, and that prompt could be a line of text, right? That prompt could be one measurement from a recipe that prompt might be an image that you just are obsessed with, like maybe a painting from the Hudson School or something. And then you give yourself a directive, right? Like how do you begin making something that's in, that's in response to that prompt, right? So that directive might be get three people together and, and create um, a birthday ceremony or something. Um, that, so then you have birthday ceremony and then you have like Hudson River School is that even a movement? Hudson School, Hudson River School? Painting. Sure. I mean, you put them together and then you see what comes out of it. And it might be total garbage, but there will be this one bit of it that's like brilliant. And you're like, oh, that moment that everyone put their hands up before they, they slapped the cake around and made a big mess, that was aesthetically pleasing. So let's follow that. Like, let's move, let's move into that world. So then you step by step, you start to, you start to find what, what moves you, what, what feels good, what's striking, you edit out and you bring back in. And then from there, you know, it's really up to any artist to sort of develop their own tools for how they talk about it. It might be, you know, screening an image or it might be breaking an image or it might be um, slowing. I like to slow things down until they're a little too painful. That's one of my favorite processes. Oh it's my God. really like, because it's about attention, right? It's about how are we shaping and, and shaping attention from our, ourselves, but also from audience, people we invite in. So like, if I'm doing this gesture, it's like, how slow can I possibly get that? Yeah. Just the worst. And like, what's going on, you know? Um, <laughs> when I'm bored with that, then I, you try something else, you know? So, I love it. so those are some, those are some, some. I love that prompt directive. I'm seeing people really respond to creative constraint as, as a really helpful idea. Yeah. Um, that's wonderful. Uh, um, let me see, there's such great questions. Y'all are, are both so beloved by all of these people watching. <laughs> um, let's see, what are some interesting starting points uh, that you use as jumping off places for device pieces? You spoke about the idea of the mug and the handle. Are there any, maybe from existing work or work that you've done in the past that you could use to kind of, how did those things begin? I'm looking around. Erica, run with it. I'll, I'm gonna find an example. I'm with you. We're, we're, we're gonna find some examples. Okay. So this is something I'm obsessed with right now, right? Okay. Um, and this kind of, this is so interesting because we're in this moment of sheltering in place and like, uh, but um, I'm, I'm really interested in uh, amateur home theatrical in <laughs> the 19th century. I love it. Yeah, and in them you get all these great things around just like how to amuse, how to amuse yourself, like, um, what's a good one? How to amuse yourself when you're at home with your family. Um, and Perfect. some of them are like little plays and some of them are games. Some of them are like these like tableau vivants that were <sighs> kind of popular in the in the 19th century. So I've been collecting <laughs> all these different bits, right? And like just yep. thinking about like, oh, what is like, what is a home amusement? And like, what are home amusements now, you know? Mm -hmm. And so for me, just starting off by like taking something that is like a kind of manual, that's like a, that's, that prompts you to want to do some kind of action. That's not necessarily a play script, right? It's just like some other kind of weird sex thing. And just to do them. And I've been forcing my partner to do them, you know, against his will sometimes. Like, <laughs> you know, now that we're sheltering in place, it's stuck with me. So he's my play partner. You know, I'm like, you have, to, you have to now make a giant with me, or you have to make this like floating head, or you have to do the blue beard, blue beard tableau. <laughs> I <Yes>. love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the naughty child, you know. So you, so starting with this kind of stuff, and then my 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 hopes and dreams is that you know, I will start to collect how other people amuse themselves that aren't necessarily Victorian, right? But like, what are people like ice bucket challenges, or you put a chair against the wall and trip and over it, or people do these kinds of family games, collecting them in a kind of community, stitching them together, and creating a kind of portrait of like of home in a way. Mm -hmm. So this become this is like a beginning point. You try it out, you play it, and then you think about how do I build it out? What are the next steps? What are the next steps? And what are the next steps? And it could be a bunch of things. I love that. Oh. Um, this is a really interesting question about messaging. Are you always trying to create to get your message across, or how does it feel if your work is interpreted in an opposite way? Do you think about 
conveying a message? Do you think about the whole, I want the audience to feel this, or is it like, feel how you feel, we're making a thing, or how, how does it kind of, do you, do you consider that at all, or is that, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that I would use the word message, but I would use the word experience, because what we're doing when we're sharing the work with audiences is that we're inviting them into an experience with us. We're hosts, right? And cool. we don't want to be assholes. <laughs> and, or maybe we do, or maybe we do, you know? That, so I think that there, there's, there is, um, like I think I just think about who I want to be in the world, and and sometimes I I of course as we all want to and as we all should like sometimes we do want to provoke like part of what we do is to kind of disrupt the the patterns that 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 exist right but how do we do that in a way that isn't like calling someone out mm -hmm. do you know what I mean like how do we how do we introduce a way. How, how, how do we introduce like a structure that asks people to just to just think ever so differently about something again that we assume that we understand? Um, so I don't know that I think about messaging, but I do think a lot about experience, and I do think a lot about the kind of experiences that I think are um, like are valuable in the world, and the kind of experiences that I think um, like contribute towards a, a more like just <laughs> a more beautiful, you know, a more sustainable world. So yeah. that's awesome. That I mean, that that yeah, that's really great because there there is a, a question of kind of what is the moral of the story, what's the point of the story, and there doesn't have to necessarily be one at, in yeah. as specific a definition as we sometimes are are challenged um, to do. And and yeah, the experiential stuff. That's some of my favorite device work has been. It felt like an event, an experience, mm -hmm. a thing that I walked away and I was like. I got something way different than they did because I know you were on literally a different path than I was. And, you know, it's really, really cool. And I think the world that we live in is a little bit, it's a little bit dangerous right now. I think because we're, I think that the, the, that a lot of us are, we're, we're trying to understand what it means to be risky, right? Because yeah. we don't want to offend. Right. We don't, we, we're very conscious right now of how we're, we're all moving through a moment where we're like taking responsibility for our actions. What does it mean for me as the person I am, like living in the body that I'm in to like move through the world in a particular way. And we want to take responsibility for those, for, we want to take responsibility for the ways that we, that we present, the ways that our, the ways that we like affect, um, the ways that we move, the ways that we inspire, the ways that we shut down, you know, the, we, that we shut out. And so I think that it's, there, it, there's there's a carefulness that's mm. that that I think a lot of artists are feeling right now, and it's really hard for to to like weigh that carefulness with fear, right? Yeah. Because I don't think that we can, I don't think that we do our best our best work when we're afraid, right? Like when we're when we're feeling like afraid of doing the wrong thing, afraid of misrepresenting. Af there's there the, 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 the like, we don't want to go, we don't want to go out and play in that playground. And so I think that there's at the core, we have to also just trust that like who we are, that what we make reflects who we are, mm -hmm. right? And that the images and that the ideas that come from it, like, yes, they should be checked. And yes, we should be, we should be checking ourselves and we should, and, and our collaborators should be like, you know, an outside eye for us. And I think that we need to like, let up on the message a little bit and find figure out how we can play more wildly and more freely and figure out the spaces where we feel safe to just like cut loose and see what's there <laughs> and like take some risks and risk saying the wrong thing you know because that's that's part of the you know that's part of the learning that's part of the process right now yeah great tim, tim etchells has this great thing from force entertainment which is another one of the sort of big device groups out of the 80s 90s and they're still making work but he has this great thing about playing with what scares you. And mm. I think that's really, I mean, it's, it's just a simple phrase, but to, to play with what scares you, I think it, you learn so much about that. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> this is a great text. This oh, good. Great, yeah. Read that, everybody. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll give you a good bibliography. Yes, a bibliography. Um, this is an interesting way to talk about what um, the project that I'm delighted to be a part of, but uh, the question was, are you finding ways to devise through this now virtual medium, either alone or with, with people? I don't know if this is what you want to talk about, but what is your, what's one of your answers to that question or how has your experience in this new world been? Can I say one thing before we go there? Yeah. Because I feel like the, the for you pr practice that Ryan and I are working on right now, is, 
I, I, I want to talk about that. And you know, Laura, we could talk about that forever and ever and ever. Yes, please but tell us. Go like way back to this question, just around beginnings and around mm -hmm. like methods and around kind of like practical advice. I just wanted to to to, to throw perfect. Something yes, in the room, which is like super nitty gritty, just nuts and bolts kind of stuff. So imagine that your process is uh, is three weeks. You have a three week process to, to to make something. I always feel like the first third is just like make as many things as you can and put them all on note cards. Like find a way to summarize whatever it is that you've created on a note card and hit the studio again and again and again and again. And every day just generate five, 10, 20 little note cards. One of them might just have like a sentence on it. One of them might have like a song, a piece of choreography. And for the first third of the process, and also go into the room like knowing what it is that you're exploring, right? So before that first, before that first day, be like, we are going to explore um, whatever the thing is. We're, we're going to look at barn owls, right? And so that means that we're all going to be like researching barn owls. We're all going to be like turning into barn owls, whatever the thing is. Then the second third of that process, like go back to all of those note cards and just do them again. Like, what is it to just do them again? And then and leave huh. the edges, like the beginnings and the ends of those moments soft. Right, so like it's how you enter into a moment and how you exit out of a moment. It's like it's a you know soft beginnings and soft endings. Huh. And just hit all of those note cards again, and just like line them up in any random order, and just do them all right, and then try another order. And then you might be like, oh, this this song has no place in here. Like chuck it, tear it out, put it in another pile. You might find that you go you go into that second third with like fifty note cards. And in two days, you're like, actually, there's only 12 of these that, I, that, are, that I'm really, really interested in. And then you start playing with like sequencing of that. And then when you start putting these note cards together, when you start putting these ideas together, the transition from one moment to the next, like that feels like the most right, most exciting place for me to play. Mm -hmm. Like the, the moments that I built actually end up feeling secondary to like, how I get from moment to moment. Yeah. So the interstitial space is like so much, mm. so, so much fun to, 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 to sit in. Mm. And you just keep playing with sequencing and this thing around, around narrative arc, you know, I, I, I love, I love, I love understanding what narrative arc is. I had, I was doing a residency at Jurassic years ago and I was like, this playwright. Her name was Simone Yehuda, if she's out there. And she, um, she, she's, she was a playwriting teacher and she just had me say to her that uh, um, this is a story about blank, who needs or wants to blank. And after blanking, they finally blank because blank. So this is a story of like, Dorothy who needs or wants to go home and after like confronting the Wizard of Oz she finally got to go home because she revealed that like power lies within or whatever yeah. I love like holding I love that because I love ha having that in my DNA because because I think that storytelling and like the natural arc of storytelling is something that we're all like it lives in our blood and our bones and yeah. we were, we're drawn to it because because it is aligned it's not a forced thing right like that's how we, we move through life and that's how so for me I don't think about like adhering those note cards to that structure but underneath my just underneath my like intuitive organizing that structure is living somewhere right and it could be like such a, like, you know, I think that there's, there's this concept called the thin, it's like the thin red line. I learned it when I was working in Berlin, right? And there's this idea that like through every work of art, whether it's like an abstract dance piece, by like peanut box, like whatever, there's like a thin red line that moves moves from the from the beginning to the end of the piece. And, the, and that thin red line might be like buried underneath dirt. It might be like forefront, you know, it might be it, like that thin red line might, will live in the frame in a different way, but it's always there. Yeah. And so identifying for ourselves what that thin red line is, that could be a thematic thing, that could be a thing around like design, that could mm. be around architecture. You know, what is the line that is like gonna be the consistent thing, just mm. gonna string together, that is gonna thread together, that is gonna hold all of these seemingly disparate pieces. And to trust that the human imagination like wants to make sense out of things. Right, and the beautiful thing about the work is that mm -hmm. our job, in a way, is to like present a puzzle, right, and to give enough context to give to give like enough of that thin red line that people aren't 
like frustrated and like fuck it I just need to stu-. you know it's like how it's like it's flirting like how yeah. do we give enough so that they stay interested but not be like I'm going to talk for two hours about who I am and expect you to be interested yeah. in that it feels like I don't know making work always feels like a process of flirting where I only yeah. give you enough for you to just stay looking at me and mm-hmm. wanting more <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing I love that definition that's so wonderful and what you talked about is exactly what we've been talking about in the playwriting classes mm-hmm. about who do they want? What, who's your main character? What do they want? Do they get it at what cost? Like all of these kind of simple, like bullet point ways of breaking it down can be very intimidating because it feels very concrete, but then you go, yeah, but you can do that in 1 billion ways. <laughs> one billion, and like the character, the main character could be like this lamp. Yeah, like exactly. The story of my lamp who like wants to get, who wants to get broken. So like the thing that's going to be yeah. consistent in my piece is my lamp is going to like move through the world of my of the work and everything else around it is going to be like diverse and chaotic and heck everything else around it's going to shift but we're going to have like this one thing to just follow through and like i i love that 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 this kind of work like asks people to it asks people to flex their imagination right yeah. like and and for me like that's connected to like a deep sense of my own politic like i think that i think that we should be flexing our imaginations in order to like imagine how to continue to move through this world and how to navigate like the complexities of this world like we need we need to think creatively you know and we need to think expansively and we need to think nimbly Hmm. and so for me this work like creating work that is intentionally abstract that doesn't give the answers that doesn't like provide the message that isn't didactic that isn't luxury yeah. But that does say, like, do you want to go out on a date with me? Are you intrigued about, or like, aren't you intrigued about this thing? And just I love that lamp. <laughs> oh, I've it for a long time. Yeah, and then we could dig into, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's lamp thing, it. You know. Yeah, we could do it. That's great. That's so. How are you approaching the now? Maybe that'll be a little bridge into the the question, but also kind of what what is this now? I think you're totally right. The create the creative instinct is the is what always saves us and connects us and, and reinvigorates us and lifts us up. Um, what are you, what is your life like now? What are you working on? Are you devising in this moment? Or yeah. Not? So Ryan and I, Ryan, I just want to tell everybody just about what the For You Project is in a nutshell. Can I, so yes. we've been working, Ryan and I and Rowena, our, our uh, third club reader, um, have been working for three years on this project called For You. And it's, uh, it's, um, inspired by two very simple ideas, seemingly simple. One is to bring groups of strangers together for these kind of like intimate um, encounters, intimate, awkward, romantic, (laughs) weird, bizarre encounters, always strangers. And the other is to think about performance making as gift giving. And so oftentimes that means we're creating with a very specific audience in mind. Sometimes that means we're creating for an audience of one, Sometimes that means we're creating for an audience of 12. Sometimes that means we're creating for an audience of 300. But we're always thinking about who who are we creating for Hmm. and how do we think about generating performance so that that what we're creating is a gift to that person, to that 12 people, to those 300 people. Um, So we've been working through uh, this project and the work has, has been pretty diverse in terms of the output. Um, did I miss anything, Ray? No, it's great. Um, and so this led us to this moment um, where we're all sheltering in place and we started thinking about how it is that we could um, uh, dig into this for you method uh, to continue to make work um, in, in this moment that we're all in. And we, we our, our collaborator, Rowena, is a senior Atlantic fellow at University of San Francisco's Memory and Aging Center, the Global Brain Health Institute. And she's been looking a lot at um, uh, how to take this for you methodology and apply it to the dementia population, um, looking at like looking at working with folks that have dementia and their caregivers. And so we were about to launch into that work. And Rowena has also had her toes dipped into working with elder folks, uh, making art with elder folks for a long time. And so um, that led us, we were about to embark on that project. And that, of course, got postponed. But we decided to continue to uh, think about ways that we could work with with elder folks. And we, we I mean, the, the thing about devised work is that you work with what you have, right? Yeah. Like really look, taking a hard look at the resources that you have. And what we have now are like, we, ha- we have a lot of friends that are artists 
that are like hungry to create, that are feeling like they are wanting to engage in like meaningful art making practices right now. They're wanting to be of service. They're wanting to like flex their creativity. They're isolated. They're going batshit crazy. <laughs> like a lot of folks are like, what do I do in my room? And can I do like, a, is it, I don't know. And, 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 and so we were interested in creating this project that connects artists with elders. And so Ryan, do you wanna, do you wanna can I tag you to talk about Artist Elder Project? Yeah, so we're, we're putting artists and elders in conversation, basically. I mean, just to ease the hardship of isolation across the board. And that looks different depending on who we're talking to. I mean, it's always, it's so, it's so person specific, right? And relationship specific. This is very relational kind of work. And we're, we're working more and more in this realm of social practice and socially engaged art, where device theater has a really interesting kind of home and working with folk outside of the theater world, right? So uh, some of the artists that we've contacted, or that, uh, that um, came to us, we put out a call. Some of the artists that came to us um, had a particular elder in mind, like a grandparent that they wanted to work with. Um, some of the artists, like yourself, um, are working with uh, folk that we've met through this process, or maybe some elders that we've known in our in our own communities, um, and then some are just total strangers, stranger artists and stranger elders that were like having these these first dates in, in a certain kind of way, and getting to know them a little bit in the same way that we would in our, our other for you processes, where it's just conversation, it's just asking kinds of questions, like what do you enjoy. Um, who are you? What are you doing? Like, what's what's behind you? What's that thing? Like, really, really, really curious questions that could maybe give us some um, creative material to play with and respond to. I think this idea of the creative response is one thing that is a good tool for devising. Is just making a creative response to something, mm -hmm. a question, an image, a person, a moment, or something. So, making a creative response is something that we learn from uh, one of the elders. Um, and so right now we have like 30 plus dyads doing We have 39. Wow. We have 39 artists paired with 39 elders. Amazing. And so each artist and each elder are having conversations. They're sometimes they're making stuff together. Sometimes they're embarking on a collaborative project. And sometimes the artist is making something for the elder. But that's 39 relationships that are that are happening right now. It's very Exciting. Yeah. Thank you, Lauren, for being a part of it, too. Oh, me. It was, uh, uh, it's been an absolute joy. And we're, we're just at the beginning, but I've had one of my conversations. It was incredibly enlightening. And um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. And it's such a great idea. It's such a simple idea. I mean, but it's all, I mean, very complex. <laughs> or I don't know if it's complex, but it seems yeah. complex to organize and orchestrate. But the idea is so pure and and, yeah. and exciting and, and true. Like something about it, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. It, that's exactly right. <laughs> I mean, this has been the real blessing of this work. I've talked about this, you know, before, but one of the blessings of the For You project is that um, that in my like earlier, I don't know, my for most of my life, I've made performances because I've been like suffering over something, right? <sighs> the reason why I make a new piece of work is that I'm suffering about something and I don't want to suffer alone. So that's like underneath what it is. So the so the the the, the, the making process performance making process is somehow connected to this um, uh, desire to have a like, community to like, process with, right? Yeah. And to study with. And this for you process that Ryan and I and Rowena have been, you know, moving through for the past three years has been such a relief because I'm no longer making work, or at least right now, I'm not making work to process my own suffering. Yeah. Right. I'm really thinking about like, I'm really thinking about impact, like how and 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 you know. As Ryan said, like I think that we're interested in art that like barely passes for art. Like yeah. some of the some of the some of the performances we make, like they're performances because we're calling them that, right? Yeah. So we're so it's really on our terms. They're performances because that's how we want to frame them and that's how we want them to be regarded. Mm -hmm. And because we're not therapists, but we do think about like the fact that the work that we make can have impact, you know? Yeah. Sometimes we get it, sometimes we get it wrong. <laughs> But like moving forward with the kind of like best, you know, with the, with the kind of best intention and kind of getting out of my own way and wow. thinking about how the work like lands, you know, in some. I mean, else. even calling it a gift is is like a a revelation. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. calling a, a new piece of art, uh, thinking of it in that way, is such a delightful mm -hmm. reframing. Uh, well, it's not a project or a product or a. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a gift. It's an offering. It's a thing. And the thing about the gift is that it's like we th we 
I don't want to, I don't want to sit in my, sit here and say like, we're giving these, I don't know, there's, there's a way that it can be like framed in a really gross way where you're like, I'm providing something that you need. And I'm the person to do that. Like, it just feels kind of gross. But like, the thing is, it's a gift for us as makers, like what's happening to the work that we've been creating, the actual work that we've been making both aesthetically and structurally, like the work is, is yeah. shifting. I'm loving the like bits and pieces that we're creating out of this prompt. So the gift is, you know, yeah, it's, it, it always, um, I'm getting a ton of questions about how you pay for this. How do you funding? How do you, a lot of it is how do you describe it enough to get funding or, you know, whereas of course my work, here's the script, we're going to produce yeah. it. You can tell what it is by its script. Um, how do you, do you have any kind of tips or, or, um, do, offerings for that? Yeah. um, first of all, like anybody can, contact me outside of this or Ryan, like if people right. have other questions, just that's because that funding question is a is a big one and it's a personal one, but I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, first of all, we make with what we have, right? So so we have to really think honestly about what that means. Like what are we wanting to make for? If I'm if I'm like I have a hundred dollars and I wanna make uh, and I wanna work for like 500 hours, that's my prerogative. So we just have to think for ourselves about what we are able to do you know for me my work is my work like this is my livelihood <laughs> and yeah. so i have to you know think strategically about about how to make it work i'm a i'm a choreographer for like for for theater for regional mm -hmm. theater although i might be out of work for a long time in that regard um but the for you project i think that we've been really lucky in that we've gotten some great support there's like there's a really um incredible organization called creative capital and they funded this initial round of For You uh, three years ago. And then we also got commissioned through Yerba Buena Center for the Arts to create three rounds of, of For You. So that creative capital support has been uh, really incredible. And they, I think they, they fund uh, projects, again, performance, they fund art that like, I hate to say it, like that it, that barely passes for art, you know, and in the Love best it. possible way, right? But they are funding they're funding folks who are really thinking about how to like reimagine how the work can live in the world and really thinking around like new new methodologies, new new rubrics uh, for gauging success, yeah. new ways of thinking about impact. So that's a, that's a great organization. We um we the project in Arkansas, we were commissioned by the museum. So that's another another way is to just directly approach a presenting organization um, with an idea. Um, and then we also just got support. There's this another really fantastic uh, organization called New England Foundation for the Arts. And they have something called the National Theater Project and they also have a National Dance Project. And so these are grants that are there. The thing that makes them so special it's a long-term relationship and it's and they look at how to move the work, how to tour the work. Oh. And so I'm very curious to see how our relationship with them unfolds over the next few years as oh, we're yeah. imagining new ways for touring. Okay. That was really, really, I think that was really helpful. There's like three or four questions about like this all sounds Can incredible. One more thing about funding though. Please, please. Thing. It's like you just do what you can. Like mm -hmm. that sounded very like official because I'm talking about about commissions and grants, but also like you, like you work with what you have. Like when I first moved to San Francisco, I like exchanged art modeling for space at a Buddhist center. And I made it, and we made a show at the Buddhist center and then we kept all the ticket revenue. And that was like, and I worked at a cafe. So every person that came into the cafe, I was like, you have to come see my show. So you just like, I think as we're devising new work, we are devising processes and we're, and we're devising like our own terms, right? Our yeah. own terms for how it is that we create. And I think that we, that, you know, this, this thing that Ryan's talking around with constraints, like don't, we don't have, we, we can work with whatever those constraints are. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and to feel, I think the cool thing about this work is that we are not beholden to proscenium, right? We are not beholden to presenters. We, we, we are, we can continue to create with what is available to us on our sidewalks you know. And I, I would say that uh, when we look at a lot of theater companies and um, makers, there is a connection to the university. I think that teaching is one of the avenues where you can use all of the resources of, of a university or of a school as part of your creative research. And I don't think that that's the only avenue. Like I think about, um, 
you know, good to go back to Goat Island, a lot of the members had other jobs. They were uh, carpenters and they worked, you know, as, at, uh, you know, other in other contexts. So I think about Leslie and Helen, like I think about Helen using, you know, they're interested in this question of loss. This is from a company called Curious out of London. They're really interested in this question of loss. And to research it, Helen took up a job at the Lost and Found for like the train stations in London, right? And worked there for a long time and <laughs> used her creative research, but also got paid, right? Because you're, you're doing this kind of bit. Yeah. And I think that, you know, wherever you are in your life, like you can use anything, like anything that you're up to as the occasion and opportunity to make. And that you can kind of make that choice. Like if you wanna, if you're, if you love gardening and that's your bit and you're really into gardening and you garden all the time, or maybe you hate it, but you just happen to be doing it. Start thinking through that. Like start looking around and being like, what is mowing and clipping? And what is the choreography of this? And what are the different sites and contexts? Like, I, I think that, that there are these different ways that we can support this kind of play. And just to go back to the very beginning of our conversations where Erica's playing with Brave New World and I'm playing with garbage as a you know young kid in high school and not just like making stuff and being bizarre. Like it doesn't, it doesn't cost a lot to play. Mm. And you, you have to find a way to support more play in your life. And that's kind of like a lifelong thing. That's not even just a, a devising process thing. It's like, how, how do I play with my partner? Maybe my partner becomes the, the, the occasion for a gift performance. Mm. How do I play with my local community, my church or something? And like that becomes the occasion. So I, I don't know, that, that would be my sort of addition to that conversation around Great. support. Um, as we're ending our hour already, um, could you, there was somebody's question um, about what was the, what was the last piece of work that like took your breath away or was just the most, the greatest thing according to you? Um, do you have something that you could describe for us about the last thing? I guess it doesn't have to be theater. It could be anything, but I think they were asking about a play, but, or a device work, but. Hmm. I'm trying to, it's, a, it's like this thing of like hit, or I'm like, what's the first thing that comes to mind? I know, um, yeah. I, there, there's a company called, I always get the number wrong, 800 Highwaymen. That's what I was gonna talk about. Oh, 600, 800, 800. 800, I was gonna talk about that. 800 Highwaymen, I'm just, there, there's something about this piece called The Fever that- That's uh, Ryan. <laughs> no, no, <dude. laughs> Um, <laughs> Y'all are the same. <laughs> you, can look, you can find some um, uh, video of online. I encourage you to look uh, for their company and they're based out of New York and uh, they're sort of kindred spirits in a lot of ways. But mm. just these different, um, my favorite, I guess my, if there's one thing within that piece that I just, I think about all the time is the um, light ask in terms of participation. So sometimes you're like, you need to participate with me, get on stage. Or, <laughs> but just these subtle ways of, of asking for help, like, will you help me? Or, you know, um, can you can you stand here versus stand here? And I just thought that was just such a, I know it sounds so silly and simple, but uh, being in it, I was like, wow, this is a really gentle form mm. of participation that's super effective. So I, I, I think about that work right now. What about you, Erica? Anything? I was really going to talk about that same work. Like some of the work that I've been most excited about is um, is work that just asks the audience to to sit in the room in a different way. And, and another piece that came to mind. Hey, Ryan, what was the artist that we saw when we were at the momentary where we read famous speeches? Oh, Spokioki. Um, uh, let me think of her name. I'm gonna look. Okay, let me think of her name. So there, it was in the it was at this gallery space. And there was a whole binder of just famous speeches and the public could just pick the speech and and it would come up on in the, on a karaoke screen and you could just like read that speech and you would just sit in the space and the space was open for maybe three or four hours but just to see like all of these really um powerful words that have like changed the course of history mm. be embodied just by you know by the every person people and what funny because, um, annie dorson she does like algorithmic theater and she's you know right, very yeah. sweet. i don't know her but i yeah but i i love i i that piece came to mind that's, that's great cool. Um, maybe if there's any, we've been asking for like a, a, somebody said about a bibliography would be great. Are there any like a book or so that you might want to share with folks? All the books. So, 
This is um, the Goat Island a collection of texts called Small Acts of Repair. It's collaboratively written amongst all the different members as well as people within the fields. Um, it's a beautiful text and the back of it has a number of exercises that you can use. Right. Um, Erica, your turn. No, you go ahead. Um, I think uh, 39 micro lectures. We did not plan this. Like we honestly just, we, we just, we did. <laughs> Um, certain fragments from Tim Etchell's has right. um, some great uh, history of their work, but also provocative essays and the, their poetic and some exercises. I think this is really like uh, Hansi's Lehman's post-dramatic theater does a great job of historicizing some of this work if you're interested mm -hmm. in that. Um, also the Wooster Group handbook or okay. book is really good. Is there somewhere, Lauren, that we can just post for your... Yes, viewers? this will be on my Facebook page as well as HowlRound, but my Facebook page, you could add in the comments anything. And um, there are some some stuff that I'm sure they would appreciate if you want to pop in um, some, some specific answers. But um, thank you. I'm so sad to wrap it up because I, oh my gosh, this is, this is really amazing and quite generous um, of you. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your time and your internet bandwidth. <laughs> um, this was so great. Uh, thank you all for your questions out there and um, thanks for listening. Thanks Lauren for everything that you do. This is so fun to be with you. It's so great. <laughs> I'm so glad to get to know you both a little bit more through your work and may we be able to continue this conversation in person safely shortly. Yes, take care. Right. Thanks, more soon, bye everybody.